Okay, I decided to do a topic that I don't normally do. I've, I've done many talks on the geology of the, of the Valles Caldera and an overview of the Jemez Mountains in general. But um, this one, I just kind of wanted to decide to focus on the geology of the northern Jemez Mountains, uh, which is where I spent three years doing a lot of geologic mapping for the state map program. It's a program run through New Mexico, the Bureau of Geology, New Mexico Bureau of Geology down at Socorro and funded in part by the U.S. Geological Survey. And there's literally been an army of mappers that have been mapping the Jemez Mountains at a scale of 1 to 24,000. So we're coming up with a very very new detailed geologic map of the Jemez Mountains, and hopefully that will be published uh, at some point in the near near future. So let's see here. Let me go on. Um, so this is a the simplified kind of geologic map that was produced by Smith, Bailey, and Ross. Uh, this was published right around 1970, and it really was a groundbreaking publication, uh, a map covering all of the Jemez Mountains, uh, but including, of course, including, of course, the Valles Caldera, this jewel in the center of the Jemez Mountains. And along with this map, Smith, Bailey, and Ross published their interpretations of the different episodes of volcanic activity that occurred throughout the Jemez Mountains over a span of, of around 12 to 13 million years. And they also include their interpretation of the eruption of the Valles Caldera. So uh, if you look at where the boundary is between what we consider the Colorado Plateau this province that includes northwestern New Mexico and goes across much of Arizona and Utah and parts of southwestern Colorado as well. That boundary, the eastern edge of the Colorado Plateau, runs almost through part the western part of the Valles Caldera. And to the right of that boundary, we are in the Rio Grande Rift. So the town of Los Alamos is in the Rio Grande Rift and the eastern part of the Valles Caldera is considered in the Rio Grande Rift. So the rift is largely responsible for much of the volcanic activity in the Jemez Mountains. And uh, the rift has been forming for about 30 million years, literally tearing the crust of New Mexico apart from north to south. We have a series of basins from the Taos Basin to the north, Española Basin, Santo Domingo Basin, Albuquerque Basin. Uh, these separate basins actually are all part of this feature of the Rio Grande Rift. And there's, there's really no recipe for volcanism greater uh, on our planet than when plate tectonic forces are causing the crust to pull apart. Anywhere on the planet that crustal forces are extending, pulling apart, that really allows magma from the mantle to come up into the crust and leading to volcanic eruptions. There's a second weak tear in the crust of New Mexico called the Jemez Lineament that also runs through the Jemez Mountains, uh, but it runs to the Northeast up to the Raton, Springerville, Capulin area and trends down to the Southwest through the Jemez Mountains, through Mount Taylor, through the Mal Pais, and even on into Arizona. So where these two tears in the crust of New Mexico intersect, that's where we have this massive volcanic range that's produced the Jemez Mountains. Uh, so before I kind of get started with the geology, I'm gonna take you on one Google Earth flight, uh, basically showing you the route that I would take to work for about three years doing geologic mapping in the Jemez Mountains. So uh, here we go. You can see the outline of the Valles Caldera in blue, and we're flying down over the town of Los Alamos, now coming up to the town of Española along the Rio Grande. And uh, once we get low enough here, we're gonna spin around to the looking to the west, 
and you're going to see Forest Road 144 right here. This is going to be on the north end of Española. And this is the road that really gives you access to the northern Jemez Mountains. Let me pause it right here. You can see on the left side of the road or the south side of the road, there's a large pumice quarry. And that is actually mining pumice from not the Valles caldera eruption, but an older caldera called the Toledo caldera that erupted at 1.6 million years ago. Uh, the Valles caldera eruption was at 1.25 million years ago, so about 350,000 years younger than this older Toledo caldera. Anyway, as we continue up Forest Road 144 and we start to climb, we enter a lot of volcanic rocks that erupted around 10 million years ago. And we get to certainly higher elevations. And now we're coming up to a, a very large lava flow from Chacoma called the Gaina lava flow. I'll just pause it right there. There's been fires in the past that have kind of cleared out the forest here, but this road here is going up the Gaina lava flow it erupted about 4 million years ago. And there's Chacoma Peak. Now I've included an overlay of, of bandolier tuff, which is going to be this uh, yellow, yellow color uh, draped over the topography. And that was what came out during the eruption of the Valles caldera 1.25 million years ago. But I'm also including the older Toledo caldera eruption, which produced the lower bandolier tuff, which you can see by that orangey color here in the distance. Uh, we're coming up to the rim of the Toledo embayment. So this mountain right here, which has all these logging roads, it was heavily logged. That's Cerro Toledo. It's a volcano that erupted in between the two caldera eruptions that formed. And then once we get beyond it, we're going to be on literally the north rim of the Valles caldera, which I think has the most spectacular view of the caldera uh, from the rim. And I've been to most of the good viewpoints all around the caldera. All right, so as we continue to fly over, we're now coming up to the north rim of the Valles caldera and we'll spin around and gain some elevation so you can really enjoy the perspective of the Valles caldera looking to the south. And I'll pause it again right here. So the outline of the Valles caldera here in blue, and you can see in the middle of the Valles caldera, there's a large mountain called Redondo which is actually composed primarily of the bandolier tuff that was erupted during the caldera eruption. So it's the only place inside the caldera that really exposes uh, the, the eruptive product that came out during the eruption. There's a lot of other uh, small volcanoes inside the Valles caldera, but they're younger than the actual eruption. So outside of the caldera, you can see the lower bandolier tuff in orange, the upper bandolier tuff in the yellow color, and you can basically appreciate the distribution of these two tufts from the two caldera eruptions. Looking to the south, we can see San Diego Canyon right here. That's the main outlet and really the only outlet for meteoric water that falls inside the caldera. We've got San Antonio Creek running on the north side, the East Fork Jemez River on the south side. They join up at Battleship Rock and flow out as the Jemez River. And that is the only outlet for, um, for water inside the caldera flowing down the Jemez River and eventually into the Rio Grande. You can see that there's an area of high topography uh, heading south from Redondo Peak outside of the caldera. These tend to be older volcanics dating from uh, seven to 10 million years, making up this spine of high volcanic peaks going off to the south. Okay, just to finish, go ahead and finish this um, flight. We'll spin around here to the west side of the caldera and continue spinning until we're facing to the north. And once we're facing north, I'll go ahead and, and pause the flight one more time. Uh, so we're looking down into the Rio Chama Valley. 
now this is a big canyon copper canyon right there uh, this is a high volcanic plateau called La Grulla Plateau. And this is in between La Grulla Plateau and Cerro Pelon and other volcanoes over here to the east. There was a low part in the to topographic rim that allowed pyroclastic flows from the Valles Caldera eruption to pour down to the north and certainly reached the ancestral Rio Chamo 1.25 million years ago. So most of these mesas in between Cerro Pelon and La Grulla Plateau here, most of these flat mesas, they are capped by the upper bandolier tuff from the Valles Caldera eruption. Now, if we were to continue following uh, Forest Road 100 down to Youngsville, uh, you can see this is going to be Cerro Pedernal. So we'll do a quick flyby of Cerro Pedernal here. And once we hit Pedernal, it's capped by an 8 million year old lava flow that's been protecting it from eroding. And we'll continue on to the south, crossing the Rio Chama, uh, over to this beautiful Canyon de Cobre, Copper Canyon, that's on the, on the north side of the Rio Chama. And now that we're over here, we'll go ahead and spin around one more time taking a look back at the Rio Chama Valley and the Northern Jemez Mountains from this perspective. So this is probably my kind of favorite part of, of New Mexico. This Abiquiu Rio Chama area where you have the Colorado Plateau off to the west, you have the Northern Jemez Mountains and you have the Rio Grande Rift all these three geologic provinces meet up in that Abiquiu area. So you have such a wide diversity of rock types, colors, and textures. You know, it's just a great place to, um, to hike, enjoy scenery, and to try and learn and understand the geology. Okay, let's, uh, let's continue on now. And what I'd like to do for this talk is really just look at the geology of four USGS seven and a half minute topographic qua crop <laughs> quadrangles uh, that cover the northern Jemez, just north of the Valles Caldera. These are the four quadrangles, Vallecitos to the east, Polvadera Peak next door, Cerro del Grant, and then Jarosa over here to the west. Uh, these are four more quadrangles to the north of that, but we're just going to focus on these four quadrangles. Um, I was, the, I spent most of my time in mapping in Vallecitos, Polvadera Peak, and Jarosa. And like I said before, there's been an army of field geologists making these geologic maps all over the Jemez Mountains, you know, including my colleague Sherry. Sherry Kelly and Fraser Goff and Rick Lawrence. So hopefully this will all lead to a new geologic map of the entire Jemez Mountains in the near future. Now, these maps are available for free. So I highly encourage you, if you're interested in downloading these maps, their reports and all sorts of other free information, at the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources website, uh, geoinfo.nmt.edu. And you can have access to, uh, to all this information for free. All right, so here is the geologic map for those four quadrangles that I just mentioned. And this is kind of a simplified version We've been doing more detailed mapping, of course, but this is simplified to tell the story that I'm going to talk about today. Um, so the first thing I'd like to say is that there are topographic highlands, which are going to be the Chacoma Highlands here in this green and the La Grulla Plateau right there. And these highlands really block the pyroclastic flows from the two caldera eruptions. So there was a low spot. Here is the Valles Caldera roughly outlined uh, just below the map here. And so there was a low spot along the, the, in the topography here 
and low spots off here to the northwest that sent out these pyroclastic flows, uh, which I'm calling the Northwest Bandelier Tough Corridor to the northwest and the Northern Bandelier Tough Corridor in between the La Grulla Plateau and the Chacoma Highlands. So in particular, the Chacoma Highlands have the high peaks of Pulvadera Peak and Chacoma, so you really don't find Bandelier Tough flowing off to the northeast in the northeasterly direction. All right, so what I'd like to do is just go through this geologic map and the different colors that are on this map represent different types of rocks and different ages of rock in the geologic past. So we'll just do the standard oldest to youngest progression, working our way through this geologic map and I'll tell you a little bit about what those rocks have to tell us geologists. So we have to, the oldest rocks that are on, on the map area are actually part of the Colorado Plateau. And these are going to date back all the way to around 300 million years ago. And they are going to include Paleozoic sediments of the Madera limestone, uh, and the Cutler group, which is Permian from back in the Permian period, and also sediments deposited during the Chin Li period in the Triassic period. And this is those colors representing those rock types. And you can actually see a few kind of dark green exposures here in the far western edge of the map. And those are actually pre-Cambrian granite exposures. So we, we actually have beautiful contacts of the Great Unconformity exposed right over here where we have 340 million year old sediments right on top of 1.4 billion year old granites um, in, in that section. So it, it basically coincides with the same great unconformity we see on the Sandia Mountains. When you look at the Sandias and you see those layered limestones that cap the Sandia Mountains and they are resting right on top of that Precambrian granite that makes up the core of the Sandia Mountains. Well, this is basically that similar contact exposed right over there. Now these sediments that met that uh, from the Permian and the, and the Triassic period, they are mostly river deposits and they tell us that the landscape of northern New Mexico was barely above sea level at that time and uh, was a very flat landscape. So they are similar to what uh, sediments all across the Colorado Plateau to the west tell us that much of the Four Corner States was basically at sea level for a couple hundred million years and uh, sometimes was barely below sea level and oceans came in, sometimes was barely above sea level, and we had a variety of different rivers and sometimes sand dune deposits covering and leaving behind sedimentary rocks in their wake. Now, uh, this is one of the beautiful rock formations in the Northern Jemez, part of the Cutler group of sediments called Tea Kettle Rock. So you can just, I've gone on Google Maps and you can just type in Tea Kettle Rock uh, and it will, you'll, you'll get directions for how to, how to find that um, beautiful rock formation there. Now I have to say a couple of these units, the Cutler group and the Triassic Chin Li, have some very clay rich layers that uh, that made field work sometimes very difficult because when they get wet they are very treacherous roads to drive on. So don't plan an excursion onto those dirt roads in the north northwestern Hamas Mountains unless you know it's been dry for a good amount of time. Okay, on top of these uh, Colorado Plateau old sediments, we have much younger sediments outlined in this pink color on the map now that represent two geologic units called the Retito and Abiquiu formations. And these are really important formations because the Retito and the Abiquiu formations tell us that the Espanola Basin and the Rio Grande Rift 
is starting to form. Uh, they date, these two formations basically were, were deposited between 29 and 20 million years ago. And as this tear in the crust of New Mexico was happening and the Española Basin began to subside, the Española Basin began to fill in with sediments. It was subsiding, sediments started to fill in this low depression. And as the basin was subsiding and filling in, there was not much topographic distinction between the Colorado Plateau to the west and the Rio Grande Rift to the east. And oftentimes these rift sediments actually spilled onto the Colorado Plateau. So we do have a lot of these pink colors actually over here on the Colorado Plateau from these two formations. The next color on the geologic map, we're going to jump all the way over to the east side, and they're going to represent volcanic rock, rocks erupted between 9 and 11 million years ago. And they form this high mesa called Lobato Mesa in the northeastern Jemez Mountains, uh, mostly basalt. The blue color you see are basalts. Uh, we identified four main uh, vent areas for the eruption of these Lobato basalts during our mapping. But there was also a silica-rich volcanic center called Los Cerritos that erupted and is colored purple that we see right there. So if you've not been up on Lobato Mesa, you know, it's a great place to get to. And you have this really steep escarpment that provides outstanding views to the east, looking over the Española Valley, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains uh, over here on the skyline. You can see Big Black Mesa here. So if you get to the edge of Lobato Mesa, you will be rewarded with some wonderful views to the east and to the north. And this, this mesa, again, is capped by these basaltic lavas. Uh, these lavas, in turn, are on top of soft sediments of the rift that are part of the Tasuki Formation. So these basalts are protecting that Tasuki Formation from eroding. But once you, you know, jump off the escarpment into the valley there, you don't have these basalts, and so it's all eroded down uh, steeply. Uh, this shows you one of the volcanic dikes that was part of the Lobato Mesa eruption series. You can see this dark vertical feature. You can see Tasuki formation, the softer pinkish orange sediments off on the right side and the left side of the dike. And I'm standing on the dike in one of these arroyos. And I believe that is Dan Koning's dog right there. But it was many years ago. OK, so uh, so that tells us about the uh, Lobato Mesa and the Los Cerritos Rhyodacite over here. The, um, the next big pulse of volcanism is going to occur. We're going to jump back over here to the west. And between seven and eight million years ago, we had a series of eruptions that produced mostly andesitic lavas, intermediate silica composition lavas but a few day sites as well, a little higher silica. And they formed this uh, plateau of volcanic rocks. There's a couple of vents on this plateau as well uh, between seven and eight million years ago. So this is going to be one of the high areas even today, this La Grulla Plateau. And because we have the Valles Caldera boundary right at the south end of the map area here, appreciate that this line of volcanoes that formed these lavas continued on to the south. However, the two caldera eruptions, the Toledo caldera 1.6 million years ago and the Valles caldera 1.25 million years ago, they've obliterated this, these rocks that used to continue on to the south across the caldera. So once you cross that caldera boundary, you won't find these lavas anymore inside the Valles caldera. OK, uh, next, jumping up to 1 million years, in between 6 to 7 million years ago, we have kind of three exposures, small exposures, of 
very silica rich lava that we call rhyolite uh, that was in place just north of the rim of the Valles caldera. So this corresponds with an episode of volcanism throughout the Jemez Mountains we call the Bearhead Rhyolite Phase. And it, it all occurred between six to seven million years ago. And if I pull back and look at a satellite image of the entire Jemez Mountains, you can see kind of these three centers uh, that we just showed here north of the Valles Caldera. But look at all these different centers we have of barehead rhyolite south of the Valles Caldera. So again, appreciate that the Valles Caldera and the Toledo Caldera, which was essentially located in the same space as the Valles Caldera, those two eruptions have obliterated any continuity there might have been from south rim to north rim. So certainly there were barehead volcanic vents where the Valles Caldera is today. Now for us, probably the most famous of these barehead rhyolitic eruptions uh, was Bearhead Peak, which formed 6.8 million years ago in the Southern Jemez Mountains. And as this rhyolitic volcano had several burps, explosive burps sending out ash, sending out pyroclastic flows. It also had debris flows. Uh, we have an area to the southeast that was low that just filled up with all the different deposits during that period of activity Why Bearhead was an active volcano. So when you walk through those deposits at Tent Rocks, you are looking at kind of the life story of the, um, the birth and the death of Bearhead Volcano in the Southern Jemez Mountains. So those beautiful formations we have at Tent Rocks, including the Seven Dwarfs, uh, those, this would be a uh, pyroclastic flow right here that came out of Bearhead Volcano. Okay, that's the Bearhead Rhyolite. The next color to talk about is going to be this lighter green color that represents volcanoes active dominantly between three to five million years ago that produces a phase of volcanism we call the Chicoma phase uh, or the Ch Chicoma formations. Now excuse me for spelling Chicoma a couple different ways but um, but that's just you've I don't think there is a, an exact correct way to spell Chicoma, uh, but in the geologic literature of the formation, the we spell it T S C H. But on most of the geolog on the maps that I see, it's spelled C H Chicoma. Anyway, so the focus of volcanism now shifts over back to the east. And we're going to have a series of volcanoes from north to south that are going to form these volcanoes that we're actually very familiar with today because they still make up the prominent peaks in the northeastern Jemez Mountains. And that's going to include Cerro Pelon to the north, Polvadera Peak, Chicoma Peak. It's going to continue on to the south, including towards Los Alamos and include Cerro Caballo. It's going to include Pajarito Mountain. It's going to include, uh, oh, I'm forgetting the, the other one. Anyway, all those peaks that make up the backdrop behind Los Alamos, Sierra de los Valles, uh, they, are, they were erupted and formed during this period of Chicoma volcanism. And so if I, if I show you kind of the bigger picture of the Chicoma uh, volcanoes, you can see that they basically make a triangular shaped outcrop distribution from north to south, a dime, I should say a diamond shape. And here's the town of Los Alamos. Um, here's Pajarito Mountain erupted around 3 million years ago. Uh, Rendija lavas erupted around five, Caballo around three, Chicoma four to five million years ago, Polvadera around three million years ago. And just like before, you can see that there's a big gap missing of you know, this, this diamond shaped distribution 
path has been disrupted because there's a, an, a circular feature we call the Toledo Embayment that was a collapse zone during the older Toledo caldera eruption. This little circular feature collapsed and that destroyed much of the volcanic peaks that were part of the Chacoma formation. When the younger Valles caldera eruption occurred, the boundary of collapse was to the west of the Toledo embayment. It did not include the Toledo embayment. And in fact, you can see some of this light orange color. That's from pyroclastic flows erupted from the Valles caldera that filled in part of the Toledo embayment right here. You can also see there's a pink color and these represent volcanoes that were that came up in between the two caldera eruptions. Uh, the biggest one of these volcanoes is called Cerro Toledo right there. So we have a couple of volcanoes in place in between the two caldera eruptions that filled in the Toledo embayment. Anyway, this phase of volcanism that produced the Chacoma formation is really unusual. The, the magmas were very silica rich, a composition we call rhyodacite. And typically when you get silica rich magma chambers, they tend to have explosive eruptions that produce pyroclastic flows, uh, much the way the Valles caldera eruption did producing the upper bandelier tuff. But, uh, but this phase of volcanism, these silica rich magmas ended up just oozing out as very thick pasty lavas. And uh, as they oozed out, they formed these volcanoes we call lava domes. And that's what Polvadera, Chacoma and Caballo represent are lava dome volcanoes that put out these really thick, slow moving lava flows. So nothing like the basalt lavas we're familiar with today erupting in Hawaii and are really typical eruptions we have in the Rio Grande Rift. Uh, these would be uh, something rarely seen during historic times. So um, a couple of other kind of prominent lava dome volcanoes in the northern New Mexico would, would include San Antonio Peak and Ute Mountain up near Taos as well. Those are, those are similar type of, of volcanoes up there. Okay, so these lavas that erupted, uh, they tend to have, oopsie, sorry about that. Where am I? Uh, they tend to have very large crystals. So the magmas were filled with these crystals of dominantly a mineral we called feldspar when they finally oozed out to form these lava flows. Uh, the lavas tend to be very gray in color but they tend to have a silica composition of around, uh, on average, 68% silica. Uh, this is one kind of unusual exposure of the lavas that's on a ridge in between Chacoma Peak and Polvadera Peak. So if you're ever hiking that ridge along there, you may come across this almost a mile stretch of pretty flat topography that just has this jumbled mass of Chacoma lava, and it probably represents kind of what we call a rock glacier, where at least in the not too distant past, the ground was soft and jello-like enough, perhaps even from permafrost in the past, that allowed the lava flow to break and slowly move, breaking up into large pieces. And, and it's even possible that today, there's movement of these blocks that are keeping vegetation and trees from being able to grow up through this mass of, of lava slab boulders. So it's, it's uh, we call this a rock glacier. Um, to show you on Forest Road 144, when you're climbing up to the north, the backside of Chacoma Peak right there, uh, this is one of the main lava flows that you drive up, this Gaina lava flow that was erupted right around 4 million years ago from a vent right here. 
and you can just see the fan-shaped topography of this very thick lava flow. Uh, these lava flows tended to be a couple hundred feet thick, uh, 100 to 200 feet thick, so uh, really thick, pasty lava flows. And over here, this is where Forest Road 144 goes by this one Another silica-rich lava flow, but much older, right around 9 million years ago, the Los Cerritos vent right there. And Lobato Mesa is seen uh, down here in the lower right corner. Uh, when you're driving Forest, one, for, Forest Road 144 and climbing up onto the Gaina lava flow, and you look back to the north over Lobato Mesa, this is your view. Uh, you can see the Rio Chama Valley, in the distance, Canyon de Cobre, Sierra Negra right there, and Lobato Mesa, these higher forested sections, that's this roughly 10 million year old basaltic lava uh, flow plateau. And you can see that there are three kind of major faults that cause these, uh, this is the up, that side down. So these faults have caused these ridges across the landscape, disrupting the Lobato Mesa Plateau, uh, you can see from that perspective. Okay, so that's the Chacoma Formation, erupted mostly between three to five million years ago. Uh, next thing on the itinerary, we jump up to 2.8 million years ago, and if you missed it, it's going to be these little red dots right here on the north end of the Chacoma. Uh, and they are going to represent one single eruption uh, that produced a lava flow we call the El Alto Basalt. Um, so here is Polvadera Peak right here in the bottom. And what the El Alto eruption was, was a fissure style eruption represented by this dashed line here uh, that produced uh, this fissure, uh, was certainly active for many hours before it kind of settled down to maybe isolated vents along the fissure, but lava poured out from this fissure, flowed downhill, and eventually flowed down the ancestral Abiquiu Creek drainage into the Rio Chama Valley. And so to give you a different perspective of what this eruption uh, looks like, uh, here is the town of Abiquiu on the bottom. Here is the Rio Chama Valley. Here is Polvadera Peak um, off to the south in the northern Jemez Mountains. And here's a high plateau called Mesa El Alto. And this is showing you where that fissure opened up. And the lava poured out of the fissure, flowed downhill, uh, the lava kind of skirted a little bit of a high topography there, joined up and continued on flowing down the ancestral Abiquiu Creek drainage into the Rio Chama Valley. So that eruption was just 2.8 million years ago. And when that happened, the floor of the Rio Chama Valley was 800 feet higher than it is today. So the Rio Chamas carved down 800 feet in the last 2.8 million years. And today, the Abiquiu Creek drainage is just to the west of, of the, where the lava flow is. So this is the canyon Abiquiu Creek has carved uh, since that lava was in place. So all throughout the Northern Jemez Mountains, we have these these lava-capped plateaus or lava-capped mesas that tell us the topography is inverted through time as the landscape is eroding. So when you see a lava-capped mesa, and we see these all over northern New Mexico, just appreciate that when, that when that eruption occurred, the lava is going to fill the lowest part of the topography. Uh, but over time, if the landscape is eroding, the rocks that don't have a lava cap, which would be resistant to eroding, that, that landscape begins to erode away. And eventually, over time, the, uh, the, the valley filling lava flow turns into a lava capped mesa. So that's, that's an inversion of topography, and we see that throughout northern New, Me New Mexico. 
it really tells us that northern New Mexico in the last two million years is a landscape under vast erosion. And that's in part due because of the ice age that we've been in in the last two million years. So this is the village of Abiquiu. This is that El Alto basaltic lava flow capping Mesa de Abiquiu here just on the east side of the village of Abiquiu. Okay, so that was the 2.8 million years ago. We have to jump forward 0.8 million years to the next phase of volcanism, which is going to produce uh, not basalt, but the other end member rhyolite at 2 million years ago that we call the El Rechuelos rhyolite. So you can see these three kind of exposures of pink here that are on the west side. This is Polvadera Peak. And that's where you go to find El Rechuelos rhyolite. Um, I'm not going to say too much about these, um, these deposits. Uh, they were pretty low volume. I think the one kind of exceptional feature is they were rhyolitic, high silica. And all three of these domes have obsidian, uh, glassy, you know, dark obsidian as a component of the lava that was erupted. And in particular, this one to the south here, the southernmost dome, that produced a, an obsidian uh, that the archaeologists all like to classify as weapons grade quality obsidian. So this particular uh, El Rechuelos rhyolite dome there was a major quarry for obsidian for the ancestral Puebloan people and certainly even older Native American people in, in New Mexico going back farther in history. So it's, it's here on the southwest flank of Polvadera Peak. Okay, we jump forward to the really catastrophic, exciting part of the Jemez Mountains. Uh, these two eruptions, 1.6 to 1.25 million years ago. And, you know, nothing like these two eruptions had occurred for the 14 to 15 million years of volcanic activity in the Jemez Mountains nothing on the scale of these two eruptions. And they were going to instantly, both eruptions were going to drastically alter the landscape, filling in valleys with these py massive pyroclastic flows. These pyroclastic flows would travel for, you know, 10 miles and farther away from the caldera rim margin in all directions to the north, to the northwest, to the west, to the, to the east, southeast uh, as well. So we have the darker orange rep, or the brown color that's going to represent the lower bandolier tuff from the Toledo caldera eruption. And then the lighter yellow is going to represent the upper bandolier tuff in place during the Valles caldera eruption. Notice that the, there's a lot more of the yellow than the brown, and that's because we still have the upper bandolier tuff that's covering up the, the older lower bandolier tuff. But roughly, they're, they're pretty equivalent volumes erupted uh, during these two caldera eruptions. And interestingly enough, the lower bandolier tuff uh, shown here in the lower part of, of this canyon, uh, tends to be a harder tough rock than the upper bandolier tuff. When you look at the two tufts elsewhere in the Jemez Mountains, it's more typical to find the upper bandolier tuff, the harder, more resistant tuff, and the lower bandolier tuff tends to be a softer, more easily eroded tuff. Uh, but so one thing that kind of tells us is the pyroclastic flows from the older Toledo caldera eruption that were flowing to the north were, were hotter. And so they tended to, because they were hotter, they tended to weld better and make a denser, tough rock in the, in the end. Um, whereas elsewhere, the, the lower bandolier tuff that was being erupted more to the west and more to the um, southeast, those pyroclastic flows were not as hot in those directions and didn't weld as densely. 
another kind of interesting thing about the upper Bandelier Tuff in the northern Jemez Mountains is the beginning phase of that eruption that went on for you know at least 12 hours before sending out pyroclastic flows. It had a very powerful eruption column that was probably going 25 to 30, 30 kilometers into the stratosphere. And ash and pumice was raining down throughout the Jemez Mountains. Uh, we know it was a relatively calm wind day uh, on when that eruption began, because throughout the Jemez Mountains, we typically find this, oopsie, sorry about that. We typically find this ash pumice falling out only about one to three feet thick. But we do see in the Northwestern Jemez, the thickness of that airfall deposit getting up to 10 to 12 feet thickness. So there was at least a slight wind blowing to the northwest when that eruption began. And then once the eruption really turned catastrophic and started sending out pyroclastic flows, those could care less what direction the wind was blowing. And they, they really just uh, went out in all directions and it was more the topography that dictated the distribution of those pyroclastic flows. Okay, so we are coming to the end of the, of, uh, the talk here. I'm just gonna kind of show you the distribution of the Bandelier Tuff uh, around the Jemez Mountains. And you can really appreciate how the high topography tended to block the direction or the distribution of the pyroclastic flows from both the caldera eruptions. Uh, you can see up here to the northeast, we have the Chacoma Highlands. Up here to the north, we have the La Grulla Plateau. Down here to the south, we have the Southern Jemez volcanic field that includes high topography with volcanoes that tend to be seven to nine million years old, pretty deeply eroded, but still forming volcanic highlands. And the vast majority of the pyroclastic flows went off to the west and went off to the south and to the east. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll come to an end here. Uh, let me just say that, that this is such an odd year. I've had a whole career of kind of doing my teaching outdoors. I love teaching geology outdoors. Um, so it's been a very strange year having to convert to teaching online via Zoom. You know, if only we had all bought stock in Zoom back uh, this time last year, we'd be rich. But, um, but if uh, I do have a lot of Zoom presentations coming up in the future with different organizations. And if you're interested in uh, what those talks are and when and for who, uh, just send me an email at kempter at newmexico.com and I'll put you on my geo list and, and let you know when, when, uh, when and where those talks will be. And hopefully uh, later this year, we'll get back to doing some true outdoor field trips, which is much better in my opinion. Okay, stop share. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I too am looking forward to being able to do geologic tours as well. <laughs> or just anything outside with a group of people. <laughs> um, okay, so we have quite a few questions. Um, so this one is um, from Thomas. And Thomas is asking, what is the name of the volcano where the Valle Caldera was situated or is situated? What is its status, dormant, extinct? What kind of volcano was it? Um, shield, strato, composite, other. Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I'd like to debunk one of the very common myths that probably many of you have heard that prior to the Valles Caldera, if you extrapolate from the rim, there may have been an 18 to 20,000 foot Mount Fuji-like volcano that blew its top in the formation of the Valles Caldera eruption. And um, all of the 
mapper, the field geologists that map in the Jemez, we just kind of shake our head, <laughs> shake our head. Uh, but that's that's been you know propagated over over a long period of time. Um, what's neat is if you if you study all of the rocks exposed around that make up the rim of the Valles caldera, you know you can actually get a feel for what the topography were and what what kind of the continuation of different volcanoes might have been that were there be, before the two caldera eruptions. And you, you certainly remember the Chacoma volcanoes and the La Grulla Plateau, and both of those episodes of, of volcanic activity certainly had volcanoes where the Valles caldera is today. Hmm. And probably uh, it would be the Chacoma volcanoes where the Toledo embayment is that may have had a volcano that was comparable to Chacoma Peak, 12, maybe even 13,000 feet high. Otherwise, you have the um, La Grulla Plateau that would connect up with the, the, um, the Southern Jemez Highlands. And certainly there were volcanoes that, that continued that trend, you know, but I, I would be extremely surprised if there were any uh, volcanoes that exceeded 13,000 feet. Uh, within where the Valles Caldera is today. And it, it wouldn't be just one volcano. It would have been, you know, different volcanoes, uh, but mostly mostly erupted and formed either related to the Chacoma phase between three to five million years ago, or the, um, the older phase like the Lagrillo Plateau seven to eight million years ago. And you can really tell by looking at the western rim of the Valles Caldera, where there's bandolier tough, you know, going right up to the rim, there was no high topography there. Uh, there was no previous, you know, volcano that um, that existed there before those two caldera eruptions. Huh. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. you. Know, Thank. <laughs> yeah. One one thing we, one thing we might do is um, uh, I've got kind of a field trip, virtual field trip of the Valles Caldera posted on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And um, it will include kind of a lot more in information and including that kind of a myth, a few myths that have persisted about the Valles Caldera. So, so maybe, is it possible you can send out a link to that? Yeah, definitely. We this? can send that out. Mm -hmm. We can send that okay. out with the evaluation email for okay, sure. That'd be great. I think that's a great idea. Okay. Um, okay. So this is from Kevin. Kevin is asking, so these were all kind of early on in like really right when you started talking. So the, Kevin before questions, people fell asleep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nobody fell asleep. <laughs> they were very active. Um, how might someone get the map that geologists are working on right now? The, it said one by 24,000. Yes. So I put, a, I put a slide up that showed the link to the New Mexico Bureau of Geology website. Mm -hmm. And on that website, there's a, you'll find links to maps and you can, you can also uh, just kind of do a search for, for the uh, area that you're interested. You can just kind of search the Jemez Mountains. You can search individual uh, topographic quadrangles like the Polvadera Peak Quadrangle. Um, and you know it'll it'll point you to the geologic map that you can download for free as a PDF. Many of them have reports. So um, if you didn't write down that web address, maybe we can include that in the email uh, as well um, as maybe some a few other links that I can think of. Yeah, I would love to include all the links. Um... We, I did put the email, I, I typed it in correctly the first time, but it was um, GeoInfo, right? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, there, you know, there's also for the layperson, there's a really good book written about the Valles Caldera by Fraser Goff, mm -hmm. which is, which you can also purchase at the New Mexico Bureau of Ge Geology website. Um, and there's, there's a publication from the Bureau called the Geology of Northern New Mexico Parks and Monuments, mm -hmm. which is fantastic for the geology of Northern New Mexico in general. Okay, awesome, thank you. Those are great resources. Um, 
So there's, there's a couple map questions <laughs> just to combine them all together. Um, who is publishing the new map and where will it be announced? And that's on the website, right? Uh, yes, the, uh, the map will be published by the New Mexico Bureau of Geology. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I'm, putting, I'm putting undue pressure on, on uh, Sherry Kelly, who I hope is going to be the, com the compiler for this map. <laughs> Uh, she's probably not listening to this, but, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> every year I ask her, when is that map going to be out? And, and uh, she's a very busy geologist with a lot of projects. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we keep thinking it's the next year and the next year tends to go by. I understand but, that. But stay tuned, stay tuned. Cool, stay tuned. So um, this question is from... Barbara and Barbara um, says she's been to the tea kettle arch. Um, she didn't realize it was Cutler. Is this Cutler being shed off the un? It's U N C O P H. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Bar Bar Barbara is a seasoned geologist. So yes, she yes, she has one, a layman question as well <laughs> as a yeah, follow up. So um, so one one thing this older Cutler group of sediments tell us. And they were deposited all across northern New Mexico between about 300 to 290 million years ago. And uh, these rivers were crossing over. We were a semi-arid environment at that time, but just barely above sea level. But there were some small mountains in Colorado called the Ancestral Rockies. And these rivers were originating uh, from those ancestral Rockies, flowing to the southwest across across uh, northern New Mexico, but it's also possible that there was some contribution of rivers even farther to the east, even coming off the Appalachians, that could have been contributing to the Cutler Group sediments. But but certainly from those ancestral Rockies uh, coming coming across. Okay. And then her layperson question, which I'm very interested in as well, is are there any legal places to collect interesting rocks in the Hemis? Legal places. Well, I think <laughs> fossil collecting of invertebrates is legal in the national forest. So there's a lot of places you can collect, you know, brachiopods, crinoids. You know, you want to be on the Colorado Plateau section. So there's several little little drainages in, in Jemez Canyon, San Diego Canyon, that, um, that you can find fossils. Uh, I think that obsidian collecting is, is I, don't, I don't really know, not, not in the quarries, not, right. certainly not in any archeological quarry, but there are, you know, there are some ridges like obsidian ridge, I don't, I don't know if that's legal to collect obsidian there or not. Uh, yeah, so I I better pass on that that question. I don't really that's know fair. What's, yeah. <laughs> what's legal and what's not. You know, geologists we we have a like James Bond. We have a license to collect rocks. <laughs> <laughs> that was I liked that joke. <laughs> um, what is it like to drive down FR-144? Um, what kind of vehicle or expertise does it require? So someone to take this journey. Yeah, so, so the great thing about Forest Road 144 is it is maintained by the Forest Service. And it, I've seen literally Priuses drive up 144, you know, getting to the north rim of the Valles Caldera. I would not say, you know, if you're in a regular car to go farther to the west from there, because um, 144, especially if you're trying to connect up over to the west side of the caldera and highway four, there's a couple miles of very bad stretch of road, which you need a good four, four by four to, to make that connection. But really you don't, you know, any decent Subaru, Honda CRV, which is what I have, you know, we'll get you Forest Road 144 all the way across uh, to for connect up with Forest Road 100, which will take you down by Pedernal and out at Youngsville. You know, you can do that on any decent small SUV, no problem. Okay. 
Um, so I think this question is actually related. Where is the location of your favorite viewpoint in the north rim of the caldera? Well, that's that's going to stay secret. <laughs> <laughs> What what I what I would say is, uh, yeah, the view of the Valles Caldera from the North Rim uh, is my favorite view of the caldera from any any uh, perspective. And you know, so what I would say is just get on Google Earth and follow Forest Road One Forty Four and see where it gets really close to the North Rim of the Valles Caldera. And you'll see, you know, there's all these myriad of small roads that go off to either direction. You know, pick one of those roads that heads that will take you actually to the North Rim, even if it means, you know, just parking your vehicle and hiking a mile. It's not, it's not far. You won't have to hike more than, more than probably a mile to get to a vantage point of the North Rim of the Valles Caldera. Um, so yeah, I would just say do a little Google Earth research and you'll, you'll find the, the closest access from Forest Road 144 to get there. Okay. Um, so there's a lot of questions. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> shifting through to see. Um, so this one is asking about pumice mines. Yes. What formed the material in the pumice mines just on the north side of the confluence of Guay and Rhodesia, Rendia Canyon? Rendia Canyon. Mm -hmm. so, so the older caldera eruption, the Toledo caldera eruption 1.6 million years ago, uh, we know that for that eruption, the wind was blowing very strongly to the east southeast. Unlike the Valles Caldera, which was a calm day when the eruption started, it was a windy day for the, um, the older caldera eruption. So it too had this powerful eruption column going 25, 30 kilometers high. And as that magmatic you know, droplets were solidifying in the stratosphere into ash and different sizes of pumice and started to rain back down, uh, the wind started to transport that material off to the east. And the larger, denser pumices kept falling through, but the lighter, smaller pumices and ash kept blowing away. So we have these really thick deposits of pumice without ash as a component that we call the guaje pumice deposit. And that, of course, is more favorable to mine because you don't have the ash mixed in with the pumice. The ash kept blowing, blowing away to Texas, you know, on off to the east. Um, so the, the pumice quarries that are by Rendija Canyon and that pumice quarry that I showed along Forest Road 144, that's from the older Toledo caldera and a really thick, you know, the, the, the tephra deposit is 20 feet thick of just pumice and I mean, really, really interesting to, to go look at those deposits. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so we have a lot of questions coming in about emails and phone numbers for you. I think if you're fine with that, we'll also include your email in the evaluation when we sent it out along okay. with all the other links. Okay, yep. Um, Cause I'm assuming they all want to have tours with you now. <laughs> um, are the canyons around the Pajarito Plateau examples of topography inversion? No, the, um, you know, the, the canyons that are, are being carved today on the Pajarito Plateau, they're just a fantastic way to appreciate how much erosion occurs in northern New Mexico in 1.25 million years. Because one thing we know is the Pajarito Plateau was a totally flat surface at the end of the Valles Caldera eruption. Those pyroclastic flows filled in all the topography, creating that cap layer that makes up the Pajarito Plateau. So there were no canyons. And um, in fact, you know, 
the new canyons that form, some of those canyons form right above where old canyons used to be. In other cases, brand new canyons have formed not in the same place the older canyons were. So when I'm taking people up and we're getting to the C.P. Anderson Overlook view and you're looking into Pueblo Canyon, you know, that, that's a, a great way to really appreciate that canyon down there that's got just a ephemeral stream. You know, it's not a perennial creek or stream down there. Mm -hmm. All that missing tough material in that valley, um, you know, including the overlook where my last slide picture is taken, that's, um, you know, that's all happened in 1.25 million years. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't be the same story as inversion of topography. We basically bury topography and start brand new carving, uh, canyon carving after the bandolier tuff in place. Okay. Um, so two questions about maps. One, if one person is asking you just to speak a little bit about your Valles Caldera maps, and then how much of your mapping was done with air photos as opposed to trekking over the terrain? So all of the geologists that do mapping in the Jemez Mountains, we all love and utilize air photos, uh, in particular before we go out into the field, because you can see a lot of kind of, you can glean a lot of geologic information from the aerial perspective. You can identify linear features that may represent faults, you can see some contrasting vegetation that may provide some information about different geologic units, also a fault. So, so yeah, air photos are, are a huge part. I think he asked also about the Valles Caldera map. Mm -hmm. uh, one publication that did come out recently is um, uh, lead author of Fraser Goff, which is a, a geologic map of the Valles Caldera. And that's a pretty detailed geologic map published just a couple of year, couple of years ago. And that's also available through the New Mexico Bureau of Geology website. It doesn't include the entire Jemez volcanic field, uh, but that certainly is a map publication that is um, uh, probably for most people is TMI uh, because it is a pretty detailed map that includes lots of the detailed mapping of all the different quadrangles. Uh, but it's a great contribution to the geologic literature on the Jemez Mountains. Okay, awesome. So we are getting down to six, we're 650 right now. So maybe I'll ask two more questions Good. and then we'll call it a night. There's been so many. So I apologize if I didn't get to your question. Um, so this, um, there is a question asking between, what is the difference between chert and um, obsidian? Yeah, that's a great question. And most of the people still listening are familiar with the Pedernal chert, which you find up in the northwestern Jemez Mountains. And both obsidian and Pedernal chert are essentially micro -crist crystalline quartz. So micro crystalline quartz. Uh, but they're very different. Whereas obsidian forms from you know, a rhyolitic lava eruption that oozes out. And because of its chemistry and water content and cooling rapidly can quench to form volcanic glass, uh, the chert formation that we see, especially the Pedernal chert, that is a, that's occurring subsurface. And uh, mostly the Pedernal chert, there's a unit uh, that I just kind of glossed over called the Abiquiu Formation, which is in the northwestern Jemez Mountains. And it is a very silica-rich unit. And in the past, probably warm groundwater passing through the Abiquiu Formation was able to dissolve silica and then re-precipitate it, especially near the base of the Abiquiu Formation, top of the of the Retito Formation at this lower boundary between those two formations and re-precipitated as microcrystalline quartz, very similar to the process of petrified wood. You know, petrified wood tends to be that uh, chert 
as well, microcrystalline, you're replacing quartz with the cellulose structure. So that same hmm. type of replacement was going on um, by, by groundwaters in the, uh, in the geologic past to produce that chert. Okay. One last question. Last question. There's so many. Okay. What is the role of Hemis liniment? Liniment? I can't, sorry if I'm butchering that word, in the terms of Vias caldera formation. Can the liniment be representation of the subjected ridge systems 18 million years ago that has that traveled 2.5 centimeters towards the road west from the Pacific coast? Well, uh, my, my uh, best understanding of the volcanic activity that's related to the Jemez lineament, for one, it's been active. Volcanoes along that lineation have, have basically been erupting uh, over the last 10 million years. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see a trend from, you know, in one direction over geologic time. It's not a hot spot trend as our plate would be going over a, a hot spot, leaving a trail of volcanoes. Uh, the best explanation is that deep in the Precambrian core, there is a boundary between two Precambrian chunks of crust that came together in the geologic past. And now that we are in this episode of extension in the Rio Grande Rift kind of pulling apart, mm -hmm. this this boundary of two different Precambrian crusts is slightly opening. It's not forming, it's not opening to the point to form a rift, but it's opening enough to allow magma from the mantle to start finding passageways to the surface and lead to these different volcanic fields along that trend. So uh, that's kind of what I think is the best explanation for the Hamas lineament is an old suture in the in the you know precambrian crust of northern new mexico hmm. okay i'm thinking okay. one last question in there <laughs> can the bias caldera ever erupt again we've gotten into that a couple times definitely definitely um you know will it be a caldera forming eruption we don't know but there's you know the there's been eruptions in the Jemez Mountains for 14 to 15 million years. Uh, the last eruption was just around 40,000 years ago. Uh, we're not seeing any evidence right now of magma on the move, earthquakes indicating something's happening. But we do see that there's a lot of kind of mushy rock material, especially in the southwestern Valles Caldera area. Um, so, you know, magma generation is continuing. There will be eruptions in the Jemez Mountains in the geologic future, but um, probably not in our lifetime. Good to know. <laughs> so thank you so much for answering all those questions and sharing your expertise. You're very um, welcome. Thank I learned a lot and i know a lot of people are saying thank you you did such a great job in the chat um so thank you for spending time with us, with us this evening and thank you to everyone that is still on for for tuning in and i hope you learned a great deal and if you would like to join us again for programs we have plenty coming up we have an astronomy program coming up this friday which is about uh, messier and his catalog with celestial wonder with celestial wonders and then we have a track program next tuesday um so find out more about our programs visit our website and again kurt thank you so so much and i hope you have a great evening bye, -bye. thank you everyone bye